All right, Matthew, here we go. We've got lesson 5.2.6, introducing complex numbers. I think this is the last lesson in the unit, maybe. So, so far we've dealt with real numbers and pretty much up till now, uh, throughout your whole life, you've just done real numbers. Real numbers can be rational numbers. A rational number is any number that you can turn into a fraction. So like uh, three is a rational number because you can write it as 3 over 1. Um, 1.2 would be a rational number, because you can write that as 12 over 10. You know, So those are rational numbers. And then that's pretty much everything you did through like junior high. That'd be like your rational numbers. Uh, and then we've been noticing that we have stuff that's irrational. And irrational numbers are numbers that go on forever and never repeat themselves. So that might be something like pi. Uh, that number goes forever and it never repeats itself. Or uh, we saw in this unit that like square root of two. Uh, that number is irrational because it goes forever and it doesn't repeat itself. And so this is in the perfect square. We saw those were irrational numbers. Now all of these numbers can be found somewhere on a number line. If I wrote a number line, these numbers would exist somewhere on that number line. Mm -hmm. All right, so those are the real numbers. We have not been able to solve problems like x squared equals negative four. Okay, so we've talked about x squared equals negative four. We said that if we had that, we would take the square root from both sides. And we've said that this is x equals plus or minus the square root of negative 4. But we stopped at that point earlier in this unit and said, you know what? There's no real solution. And that's correct. There's no real solutions. But now we're going to start looking at the imaginary solutions. So we're going to start looking at imaginary numbers. Mathematicians really don't like when you can't solve something. So about 500 years ago, there's this dude... He's like, I hate saying that there's no solution. There's got to be some solution out there. So he made up a whole new set of numbers called the imaginary numbers. And imaginary numbers are numbers that, unlike the real numbers, you can't point them out on a number line. So that's the definition of an imaginary number. It's not on the number line. But it's been posited that these numbers actually exist, and we can do stuff with them. Anyways, moving on. So an imaginary number is just a number that does not exist on the number line. All right, so consider x squared equals 2. How many solutions are there? We found out that there were two solutions because we could take the square root from both sides and we would get x equals plus or minus the square root of 2. So... The plus or minus means that one of our answers is positive 2 and one of our answers is negative root 2. And root 2 is about like 1.4-ish or something like that. So our two answers would be positive 1.4-ish and negative 1.4-ish. All right, how many x-intercepts does this graph have? Well, remember to find the x-intercept, we make y or f of x 0. So basically, it's the same problem. We would add 2 to both sides, and we get x squared equals 2. So that means there are two x-intercepts, just like there were two solutions to this problem. So there's two x-intercepts. Uh, did it wrong. Intercept. All right, solve the equation and put your answer in exact form and decimal approximation. We kind of already did that. We said that the exact answer was plus or minus root 2, since the radical doesn't reduce. So that's our exact answer. And the decimal approximation, since this number goes on forever and never repeats itself, we can't write it down. So we would say this would be approximately, oh, let's use a little squigglies, would be approximately 1.4 and negative 1.4. So positive root 2, which is about 1.4, and negative root 2, which is about negative 
So these would be our two x-intercepts, about 1.4 and about negative 1.4. How many x-intercepts does this one have? All right, so if we're doing an x-intercept, we make y equal to 0. We would then subtract 1 from both sides, and we'd end up with x squared equals negative 1. We'd take the square root from both sides at this point, and we would say that x is equal to plus or minus the square root of negative 1. And earlier I said in the unit, we would say this is no real solution. It's no real solution because there no, are no x-intercepts. So this particular problem has no x-intercepts. If you graph this one, we would see that it would end up looking something like this. Okay, since the u-shape, the parabola, is above the x-intercept, it or the x-axis, it actually never crosses the x-axis. That's why we get no real solution for this one, because the solutions are the intercepts. All right, so in the 1500s, an Italian mathematician named Raphael Bombelli, that sounds made up, uh, he invented the imaginary number, the square root of negative 1. Okay, so he didn't like that we were saying there's no solutions. He said, yes, there are solutions. They just don't exist, which is, he must have been crazy. Anyways, so he, we started calling the square root of negative 1 lowercase i. So from here on out, when we say i, we mean the imaginary number, square root of negative 1. Remember, imaginary just means it's not on the number line. It's on something else. So this is a new system of numbers. So if i is equal to the square root of negative 1, it makes sense that i squared would actually be negative 1, which is a real number. Because if I square this side and square this side, i squared, and then remember squaring takes away a square root, so this must be negative 1. So if you square the imaginary number i, you get a real number, negative 1. Interesting. All right, so let's move on. So what we're going to do is when we get an answer that has a negative root, we're going to split it up into the imaginary portion, which is negative 1, and the real portion, which is square root of 4. So we know that the square root of negative 1 is now called i, right here. i is the square root of negative 1. And then the square root of 4 is 2. So this would just be 2i. All right, so i is going to kind of behave like a variable. So here we've got 2i times 3i. 2 times 3 is 6 i times i is i squared. But we said here, i squared is equal to negative 1. So this is actually 6 times negative 1. So our final answer for this one is negative 6. So we multiplied these two imaginary numbers together, and they became a real number of negative 6. All right, let's look at the next one. If I do 2i times 2i, because that's what 2i squared means, I would get 4i squared. But again, i squared is equal to negative 1. So this is actually negative 5 times 4 times negative 1. So if I do negative 5 times 4 times negative 1, that comes out to positive 20. So anytime you see an i squared, change it into the number negative 1. Last one, we've got the square root of negative 25. So this is negative 1 times the square root of 25. Negative 1 is i. 25 is 5, so we would get 5i. We usually put 
uh, integers in front of i. So 5 and then the i. Okay, next one. Here's the graph of this function over here. How many x-intercepts are there? Well, it never makes it down to the x-axis. So there are 0. Solve it. Uh, so we want some kind of solving method. Let's complete the square. Since this middle number is even, let's just complete the square on this one. So I'm going to subtract 5 from both sides. I get x squared minus 4x. I'm going to leave a blank so I can complete the square. Equals negative 5 and then leave a blank to complete the square. So to complete the square, I take the negative 4, cut it in half, and square it. So this would be negative 2 squared, which is 4. So 4 is the number that I'm adding to both sides to complete the square. All right, finishing off solving it, I get a perfect square over here. The number that I squared was negative 2. So this is x minus 2 squared. On the other side, I get negative 1. So now I'm going to take the square root from both sides. I get x minus 2 equals plus or minus the square root of negative 1. I'm going to add 2 to both sides. And I'm left with x equals 2 plus or minus, and the square root of negative 1 is i. So there's my two answers. They're imaginary because they have i in it. Imaginary means it's not going to actually cross the x-axis. But I do have two answers. Remember, the two answers would be 2 plus i and 2 minus i. That's what 2 plus or minus i means. Moving on. Roots of a polynomial function are the values of x such that f of x equals 0. We've already done this before. We just called it something different earlier. Anytime f of x is 0, that means y is 0, that's the x-intercept. So roots are just another way to say x-intercepts. And x-intercepts are just another way to say the solutions of the quadratics. So roots, x-intercepts, the solutions of our quadratic equations, these are all the exact same thing. They're just different ways. They have slightly different meanings, but they're different ways to think of uh, the crossing points here. So it looks like right here, I've got two roots. So my roots here would be negative 1. So that's one of my roots, because that's my x-intercept. My other root would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. My other one would be negative 5. There's my two roots for that one. This one right here looks like it only has one root, because it only intersects at the x-axis once. And that looks like that's at negative 3. This one never crosses, so we would say it has no real roots. So the roots, the x-intercepts, the solutions, they're all the same thing. It's where these parabolas are crossing the x-axis. You can cross twice. You can cross just once. And you can never cross it all. All right, last one. 5-129. A complex number is written in the form of a plus bi. Basically, a complex number has a real section. And it has an imaginary section. So we're going to add or subtract an imaginary number from a real number. So it's always going to look like in that format for a complex number. So complex just means it has a real number with it and an imaginary number with it. So looking at this one, 
I pretty much do the same rules that I would do for variables, except if I've got i squared, we have to turn it into negative 1. So for this problem, I'm going to just distribute. 2 times 3 is 6. 2 times i is 2i. Is it in the complex form? Yes. Here's the real part. Here's the imaginary part. We are done. We don't have i squared, so we don't have to reduce it at all. Over here, I've got 10, but no other integers to combine it with, so I'm just going to write down 10. But then I've got negative 9i, and this is negative 1i. So if I have negative 9i's and I take away another 1i, I would have negative 10i's. So it's just like it's a variable. We've got a real part, and we've got our imaginary portion. Next one, we're adding. So we're just going to combine like terms. Here's my integer values, negative 2 and negative 1. Combine those two together, and I get negative 3, since this says that we're adding these two together. And then here I've got negative 7i, and I'm going to add 4i's to it. So negative 7i plus 4i, that comes out to negative 3i. Here's my real portion. Here's my imaginary portion. Next one is subtraction. Remember when we subtract, it's like there's a negative 1 there, and I need to distribute this negative 1 to these two terms. So this was addition, so that's a positive 1. So I don't really need to do anything because 1 times itself is just itself. So over here, I'm going to rewrite this problem as negative 8 plus 2i, and then negative 1 times i is negative 1, and negative 1 times negative 6i is positive 6i. So negative 1 times negative 6, that's positive 6. And now I combine my like terms. So my first like term is negative 8 and negative 1. That gives me negative 9. My imaginary terms are 2i and 6i. Those combine to give me a total of 8i. All right, here's where it gets a little bit tricky when we multiply two complex numbers. Let's just write down the area model for this one. So I've got 1 minus i and I've got 8 minus 6i. Okay, we're just going to multiply it out like we normally would on the area model. This is 8. 8 times negative i is negative 8i. 1 times negative 6i is negative 6i. And then negative 6i times negative i is positive 6i squared. All right, normally we would combine our like terms, and a lot of times in our peanut right here, these are the like terms. So we end up with 8. Here we've got negative 8i and negative 6i. That's negative 14i. And then plus 6i squared. Is this written as a complex number? No, because I've got the 8. That's my real portion. Here's my imaginary portion, and then I've got this extra, but that can be reduced. Remember, we said that i squared was negative 1. So this part is actually 6 times negative 1, or negative 6. So here we've got 8 minus 14i, and 6 times negative 1 is negative 6. So that's a real number. So I can combine my two real numbers right there. And I got 8 minus 6, so I get 2 minus 14i. Basically, when you do the area model, this i squared term is going to change. And this particular i squared term, i squared term changed into negative 6. So now you've got like terms in this peanut here. Mm -hmm. And when you have complex numbers, you'll usually have a like term in the other peanut going the other way. Because here we've got 8 and minus 6. There's our 2 right there. 
All right, that is the end of Unit 5. Congratulations, you made it. See you later. Bye-bye.